Well, welcome everybody to the North Valley Municipal Advisory Council, uh, soon to be the North Sonoma Valley Municipal Advisory Council, but not officially yet. And uh, we have our supervisor, Susan Gorin here. Hi, Susan. And uh, good to see everybody. Um, so I'm gonna call the meeting to order and I'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. As soon as we get a picture of a flag. <coughs> All right, I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States, States of, America of America and to the Republic, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. all. All right, thanks. Just a note on that. Um, Ariel told me it's not required, and you know, it's funny because. Several years ago, I probably would have said, yeah, let's, let's not do the pledge, but somehow recent events have made me appreciate, uh, you know, democracy, I'll put it that way. And um, so it feels, feels good just to kind of acknowledge it in that way. Um, uh, okay, so, um, and now uh, Vice Chair Doss, would you take roll, please? Uh, sure, Chair. Arthur Dawson, Chair. Here. Kate Eagles at large. Vicki Handron at large. Here. Mark Newhauser at large. Here. Here. Matthew Dickey. Here. Angela Nardo Morgan. Here. And we know that Melissa and Jed are both absent. Both of our alternates are gone tonight. So everybody had to show up. They're alternating. <laughs> All right, thank you, um, Vice Chair Das. Um, so uh, just a couple little announcements. Um, question and answer and, and chat are turned off for the meeting. Uh, when the public comments open, for members of the public out there, um, please use the raise hand function on Zoom, and then you'll be recognized and promoted to speak. And usually Ariel is, uh, keeps track of that, so thank you, Ariel, for um, keeping track of that. And if at any time it looks like your meeting's been hacked, um, we will immediately terminate the meeting and then reschedule for another date. Um, and uh, if you wanna make, um, I, I should just mention that, um, you know, the, the Mac has a, a limited purview. Um, and so there's a number of things that we're, we can't address as a body, as a, as a county uh, governmental body, um, including uh, land use decisions, but people are, are welcome to speak on those kinds of issues during public comments. And uh, if you wanna make a, um, have your voice in the official record on those things. Uh, you can write letters um, or speak at a meeting of the um, Sonoma Valley Citizens Advisory Council or the Board of, Z of Zoning Adjustments, um, and we'll we'll broadcast that information. But um, so you're welcome to speak speak about anything here. But there's some things that we can't necessarily address. But we'll we'll do our best to at least point you in the right direction if, if this isn't the place to for us to take action. Um, okay. Um, do I have a resolution? We have uh, two months worth of minutes uh, to approve. Do I have uh, uh, any comments or corrections on the January 13th minutes? Okay. Um, do I have a motion to accept the January 13th minutes? I'll make a motion. Okay. It looks like we have second. Second. automatically there. So um, all in favor of Accepting the January 13th minutes, um, raise your hand and say aye, or either one. Aye. 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 And then for the uh, February 10th minutes, um, any comments or uh, corrections on the February 10th minutes? Uh, I, I read them through and there's, you know, there's typos, there's a few little misused or misplaced words, but all in all, I thought that they caught the content of what was actually said, but I don't feel like it's necessary to pick it apart just for some typos. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I had the same feeling like it captured what happened well, even if there's a, a few typos in there. Um, so any other comments? Uh, can I get a motion to accept the February 10th? Okay, uh, Angela and a second to accept the February minutes. Okay, all in favor? of accepting the February 10th minutes, say aye. Or aye. 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 All right, uh, so we've 
accepted both January and February minutes. And um, just a, a note before we head into public comment, um, my goal is to finish the meeting in under two hours. Um, you know, things may happen and that may not happen, but that's my, that's my goal. Um, and if we get to two hours, uh, I may take a vote and see if we wanna take a break or, um, or push some items onto next month. Um, you know, I, I think the public works presentation is probably gonna um, take up a good chunk of time. So I don't wanna cut that short. So um, anyway, that's that's my hope, but just, you know, we'll, we're here to hear people. So we'll, we'll make that happen. Um, okay, so now we have an, an opportunity for the public to comment on anything that's not on the agenda. Um, and Ariel, do we have any hands raised? Uh, yes, we have um, Marshall Belling. Um, Marshall, so I'm going to allow you to speak and you should be able to unmute. All right, welcome Marshall. And, and we're giving uh, uh, public uh, two minutes for comments. <clears throat> You're welcome to cut me off if I go long. My wife does it all the time. <laughs> I'll let Ariel do that, but uh, <laughs> so welcome. <laughs> Thank you and thanks for the opportunity. We've lived in Sonoma County for 13 years and I really just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that in February, Sonoma County released its proposed new cannabis ordinance. The county's hosting a one hour town hall on Friday at nine o'clock and at 12 noon to hear about the new draft cannabis ordinance. And I highly recommend that if you, uh, that you attend this, if you have a well, and are concerned about groundwater overdraft. Cannabis is a very thirsty plant. It requires 1.1 million gallons per acre per crop, which is over six times more than grapes. And know that up to three crops of cannabis can be grown per year in plastic hoop houses with water demands up to 3.3 million gallons. This analysis can be found in Napa County's 9 report on cannabis that was published last year. The proposed ordinance would allow a cultivation permit on a parcel 10 acres or more that has an agricultural or RRD zoning. In the draft ordinance, the county has identified 65,000 acres of ag land that could be developed into cannabis grows. Permits will be issued with ministerial process where there is no public knowledge or participation. The size of outdoor cultivation is proposed to be increased from one acre per 10, per, per 10 acre parcel up to 10 acres or 10% of the parcel size. The county in this uh, chapter 38 said that large greenhouse cultivation operations could have 100 to 200 employees commuting to cultivation sites year round, which could add 400 to 800 daily trips on all of our roads. The county's proposal removes health, safety, and nuisance protections for neighbors who experience the smell of cannabis and fails to increase the current inadequate setback requirements, which are currently 300 feet from the cannabis to your bedroom or to your tasting room. Tasting room. Right. I hope you can attend. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, finish up. Yeah, it's um, I'd like to share a URL or direct people where to go to sign up for these um, town home town town halls. Is there a way to do that? Um, Ariel, can we put that in the? We're not using the chat, but can we put it in the chat so people can access it? Uh, yeah, I, I can um, I can drop that in because I can chat to the the attendees, so I can drop okay. it in there. I'll I'll pull it up from the website. I'm I'm familiar. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Marshall. And Thanks, Marshall. Uh, we'll, we'll have um, comments from um, the council members after all the public comments are done. So uh, are there other members of the public that would like to speak? I'm not seeing any raised hands. All right. Well, that was, that was easy. Uh, Andy, so any comments on um, Marshall's, um, Marshall's topic and what he brought up? I thought those were striking uh, statistics. I, you know, there was a lot of them, but the, the ones that I caught were pretty striking. Um, yeah, Council Member Dickey. Um, on the CAC, we've reviewed a number of, of 
project proposals related to cannabis. And uh, just in deference to um, transparency, while it is true that they are incredibly water intensive plants, in fact, we've denied a couple of permit applications on the basis of water use. Increasingly, there are, um, there are advances in the technology related to water use that are put to very good use, not only in grapes and other agricultural products, but cannabis as well. So while the figures in and of themselves are very alarming, and I would agree, most of these growers are taking advantage of of um, the advances made in, in water um, scarce, uh, in the water scarce technology. All right, thank you, Council Member Dickey. Council Member uh, Nardo Morgan. Um, yeah, that is very alarming. 1.1 million gallons acre per crop. Pretty, pretty frightening in terms of groundwater and groundwater recharge. And that's something our valley is very concerned about particularly with fires now. Um, but I wanted to ask Matt uh, with the CAC, what are some of these technologies that they're employing uh, to capture water? And are they working? Statistics that support that they're actually really uh, viable alternatives. Uh, yes, they do work very, very well. Um, uh, a lot of this stuff actually ironically is developed and developed at UC Davis. Um, and so being as in such close proximity to Davis, we do get an advantage here in the Valley for water use. The, the technologies that have become available, the monitoring systems um, that are available. Um, I think the other thing that you know, related to cannabis and, and it's growing is that the plants don't use a uniform amount of water. They use it increasingly at the end of their growth cycle. So obviously as the plants are smaller, they use less, then they increase, they increase their consumption. Um, but to answer your question, yes, the, the monitoring systems in conjunction with how they are watered themselves work very, very well. We had a presentation from Mike Benziger, and there was another guy at the top of Cave Dale that had even a larger grow. Just very, very interesting, just from a, an intellectual standpoint. You know, just the advances that they've made and, and being able to preserve water. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah, Council Member Nardo Morgan. I just had another quick question about that. I, I know Mike really well, and, and he's a very conscientious, uh, environmental visionary. But what I want to ask about the water usage and these new techniques um, is that our, our cannabis farmers, um, there's no regulation. They don't have to use these new techniques, right? No, that's true. They do not. However, I think um, the CAC received a, a, um, a water plan um, update earlier this year. And um, I think it's important to mention that monitoring of wells is going to be a part of anything going forward. Um, it's gonna, it's a requirement now, I believe. And Susan, Supervisor Gorin can correct me on that. But my understanding is that for, you know, agricultural commercial use, water monitoring is a part of the application process. All right, thank you, Council Member Dickey. Uh, any other comments or thoughts? All right, well, um, we're now gonna move on to um, Supervisor Gorin. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our supervisor, Susan Gorin, um, who was instrumental in getting this committee uh, up and running. And welcome, Susan. Thank you all so much. <clears throat> A little froggy in my in my voice. Uh, thank you all so much for what you do. Thank you for volunteering for the MAC. Uh, just to comment on the previous speaker, yes, uh, there is the proposed cannabis mod modifications moving forward. 
will come to the BZA first before it comes to the Board of Supervisors. I encourage all of you to, if you can, go on to the public workshops. Um, some of the, uh, and you're absolutely right, Matt, Dick, Matt Dickey. Um, we have uh, previously specified some pretty rigorous uh, requirements for cannabis cultivation regarding water usage, uh, what districts, uh, one of the four classes of the districts where they can be located, how they need to really access the water and not deplete the groundwater, as well as have um, uh, off the grid energy uses uh, or, or generation. Uh, I have not looked in depth uh, about the modifications of this ordinance, but trust me, I will be looking at the ordinance as it moves forward regarding over-concentration water usage, especially in uh, the upper uh, Mark West Creek watershed, one of the impaired watersheds, but it is opening up new areas for cannabis cultivation. And I will be looking at setbacks uh, as well and neighbor compatibility. This is what we've promised the neighbors for a very long time. So I'll be looking very carefully at this. Uh, please take the time to educate yourself about what the cannabis ordinance the modifications would do and would not do. So um, don't listen to other folks, do the research yourselves. In fact, uh, what, what you might do, what we might do is even though you don't have land use authority, if you want to, you could invite one of the, the new agricultural commissioner, um, Andrew Smith uh, to the MAC meeting to talk about the potential modifications of the cannabis ordinance a lot of the changes uh, happening would fall into the purview of the agricultural commissioner. They have the responsibility of approving cultivation plans and replanting for vineyards. And so it was appropriate that they also have the responsibility of approving uh, the planting uh, and the plans for cultivation for cannabis. But um, there are some changes and, and and then let me say the um, uh, buildings, processing, all of that will still remain under the purview of Permit Sonoma. So we, we do have this division going on, but we've shifted some of the responsibility over to the Agricultural Commissioner. And so it, it might be one of the um, department heads that you want to invite to get a little bit better information about what they do and how they're going to move forward and will they have enough staff to do what they need to do in permitting uh, of the cannabis. Um, it's, um, uh, it's COVID, COVID, COVID at the county. Uh, we've been having regular briefings each week and trying to figure out the metrics. Uh, and, and please let everybody know who has some questions about this. These are not the metrics that the county has imposed. These are the metrics for reopening that the state has imposed. And they may be shifting a little bit. This weekend may be a, uh, a good weekend because we may have administered, was it 2 million doses of vaccine within the state, which would trigger different metrics which may make it easier for Sonoma County to open into the red tier. <coughs> we are so close to meeting the metrics on our own of uh, uh, reopening into the red tier. But what, we're, uh, what we are missing by 0.1% is meeting the equity metrics. And that means we are really focused on um, trying to make as many of the essential uh, groups, food and ag uh, producing groups and other groups, teachers eligible for vaccines who may fit uh, uh, part of our diverse community and our Latinx community. So it's all hands on deck uh, for um, trying to encourage folks to get vaccines at a very difficult time because we have such a scarcity of vaccines. Uh, the state is moving more vaccines to the south and the Central Valley, and we keep saying, wait, wait, how about us? So we will get there, uh, but it, it's a little frustrating that we have not expanded the supply. I understand CVS has expanded their supply. Kaiser has received additional supplies of vaccines. I got my first uh, vaccination last week. Very few side effects with that. 
And I understand that the Sutter is on track to once again deliver the second doses that they had to delay. So that's all good, but uh, testing is equally important. So it, you might take yourself down to, I think it's Hannah Boy Center that has the pop-up testing. It's not the invasive Q-tip down, down to your toes uh, test. It's self-administered, and so it's much more comfortable and palatable for folks. It's one of the ways that we can increase and meet our metrics is to expand the denominator, expand the number of folks being tested through Sonoma County. Um, as I mentioned before, I think I'm one of the, and maybe I'll have Ariel forward to you. There's a work plan for the county. Uh, for the following year so that you can pay attention to vacation rentals, uh, tree ordinance. We're planning a climate change workshop. It had been planned for April 6th, and now we're moving it back into the month where we're uh, not only inviting the board, but community members to participate in that. Um, trying to think if there's anything else going on in our lives. Oh, there's probably a zillion and one things going on in our lives. Uh, and Damon might know there has been discussion about a, a revenue measure for fire services. And the discussion now is we may not move forward with that revenue measure in November. We may wait until next year. And so at some point you'll wanna get a briefing on that as it goes forward. And we all heard that the special tax, the TOT tax, to benefit schools and Bodega Bay Fire uh, did fail. Um, and Measure B, the schools tax did fail. And so now they're looking at how they're going to restructure, consolidate, and Bodega Bay has some serious fiscal woes and they're working with the county to figure out how we can provide some stopgap funding for them. They are losing firefighters we don't want that to happen because they provide essential services out of the coast. So that's a complicated story and stay tuned. I am so glad that Janice and uh, maybe Johannes are gonna be on uh, with you tonight. And I look forward to their presentation and your comments because it has been uh, exciting about, uh, about all things infrastructure. I have a couple things working on I wanna really get the multi-use path going uh, in the next couple of years, the bike lanes on Arnold uh, up and running in the next couple of years, and know that at some point we will have an opportunity to presentation from Caltrans. Uh, Melissa Dowling asked for a few details about uh, replacing two bridges on Highway 12. Caltrans came to me a year or so ago and said, we're going to need to replace two bridges, one across Hooker Creek by Madrone and one across Sonoma Creek by Hoff Road. And I said, can we hold off a year or two because we need to get the Boys Boulevard Bridge replaced and that arterial open. So that's what they did. And we look forward to uh, having a presentation for the two Max talking about the bridge and um, extensive public outreach for the traffic impacts along Highway 12. So more to come, but I just wanted to put that on your radar. And these are seriously old degraded bridge. They would qualify for Arthur Dawson's research into historical records. Hooker Bridge or the bridge over Hooker Creek is 100 to 120 years old. And we're so lucky it didn't fall down before, before this. So it's imperative that we get this replaced sooner rather than later. So that's my report uh, for tonight. Uh, and once again, thank you so much. And I'm here listening to your comments. All right, thank you, Supervisor Gorin. And- um, Chairman Dawson. Yeah, Vice Chair Dust. Just for the record, uh, Council Member Eagles has joined us. Ah, uh, thank you. On yes. the attendance. Yes. Welcome, yes. Council Member Eagles. Thank you. Excuse me, uh, uh, Chair Dawson, for being late. I was in. I was listening, but the phone allows me to come into the public part. I couldn't. I couldn't comment, so I was listening in, but hit bad traffic. Thanks, all. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be here. Yeah. Glad you're here. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to move on to the um, presentation by um, from Transportation and Public Works from uh, Janice Thompson and you yeah, see if I can pronounce his name right. Uh, Johannes Hobertz. Is that right? 
Um, and welcome to our Municipal Advisory Council meeting and we're looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say. And I'm sure we'll have questions at, at the end. Great, thank you. Um, like you said, my name is Johannes Huberts and I'm the Director of Transportation and Public Works for Sonoma County. Janice is the Deputy uh, of Transportation and Public Works. So we wanna give you an update on our pavement preservation program this year, uh, what we're planning on doing. And also the, some of the pavement preservation program is augmented by the pg and &E settlement funding. And we wanna share with you some of the projects that have been selected for, for tier one, tier two, what we're calling tier one, tier two, and, and then some of the pavement preservation projects. So Janice, do you wanna start with the pavement preservation program? And then I'll jump in with the, with the sure. uh, yeah. tier two. Yep. And Ariel, do you have uh, Janice as a co-host so she can share the screen? I will do that right now. One second. Okay. There you go. Okay, you should be good. Hold on. Coming, coming, getting it ready. Okay. Uh, so like Johanna said, hi everyone, Janice Thompson. I'm the Deputy Director of Engineering and Maintenance at Transportation and Public Works. And I have a really quick overview for you, um, kind of on um, our uh, paving program, the funding sources um, and how it breaks down by district. So are you all able to see my screen? Yes, oh, I can. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, Okay, so we call it the Pavement Preservation Program. Uh, we all shorten that to PP. Um, it is a two-year program uh, that we uh, run by the Board of Supervisors and get their approval every two years. Um, the contributions are listed there on your screen. We get a very generous general fund contribution from the board. Uh, we have uh, SB1 funding, that stands for Senate Bill 1. Uh, that is a state measure uh, where we get funding as well. And then there's, there's a few local uh, fees and taxes and um, all of that gets mixed up in a blender and spits out some funding for us. And, and for the next two year paving program, this was just an example, um, but for 22, 23, we're looking at a approximately $34 million program. Now that is countywide. I'm gonna break it down by district. So we're in district one here. Um, overall, Sonoma County has uh, 1,368 road miles and district one has 274 of those miles, which is a 20% share. Uh, District one is very large geographically. Uh, you all are from uh, the Northern section, Franz Valley, uh, Highway 12 corridor, um, uh, but uh, it's a large district, uh, including Bennett Valley, Valley of the Moon, the Springs area and Vineburg. Those were just some uh, locations that we picked out. And then here is um, what we're planning for uh, 2021. This is a list of the roads that um, we'll be doing. Um, and uh, for further information, this totals about 3.8 miles. Uh, last year in 2020, we did about 5.5 miles in District 1. Um, so uh, your paving dollars don't go very far anymore. Uh, it's very expensive to pave roads. So. I just kind of wanted to give you that general overview. I'm going to stop sharing. That's the end of that part. Um, but that's just kind of a general overview of our paving program and, and where, where the funding comes from and, and how it's distributed. Uh, and I'm not sure if you want uh, questions now or questions at the end. What's your preference? Um, why don't we why don't we keep rolling? We'll take questions at the end. If people okay. are okay with that, yeah. Okay, great. So, Johanna, that was a little bit about the paving program. Um, you want to cover uh, PG&E? Absolutely. 
So as uh, so you guys know, the county allocated, or you may know, county allocated roughly about $58 million for resiliency and infrastructure to the Transportation and Public Works Department. $31 million of that uh, is tier one, what we've designated as tier one and tier one plus. And those are roads that were initially damaged by the 2017 Tubbs fire, private property debris removal by FEMA. We applied for, for funding for FEMA to cover those damages and FEMA has denied our claim. We are still uh, pushing one more time, uh, but that, that request was denied. So the board allocated $31 million to repair those roads. And there is a list of roads that include the tier one and tier one plus projects. I have in here on my screen, I don't think that, uh, they're part of the board package and they're public, but if they're smaller, I can show them to you, but there's a lot of roads throughout the district. Um, the board also allocated $20 million for uh, what we're calling tier two projects. Tier two projects are called generational projects and we are picking projects that are either one way in, one way out to areas or narrow roads or roads that are really, um, really important if so we have any disaster and emergency and they can be an, an, a great ingress or egress for areas. Uh, we are working with the board on those segments now. Uh, we expect to take the, the road segments to the board in April or May, I believe Janice is going to take him. So, so we, in addition to that, we're also working on infrastructure uh, like for communications. And we're also working on undergrounding utilities under the CPUC program rule 20A. So we'll be coming to the board for recommendations and we'll probably reach out to you so you can recommend uh, projects where we can underground utilities, pg and &E utilities uh, that qualify for the rule 20A project uh, guidelines. Rule 20A projects, in case you don't know, if, in summary, it's like a, an aesthetic uh, program to reduce overhead wires or you know utilities and there's some criteria they have to be uh transmission versus distribution there has to be transmission lines and no distribution or vice versa distribution yeah distribution not transmission so they can be high voltage um and we have about 20 between 21 and 25 million credits to uh countywide to be able to underground projects. One project, depending on the length over a mile, it's about 4 million credits uh, that we convert into dollars when we go to construction. Um, so, and then we have a million and a half for communications and we're working with communities and improving communications during disasters. We're working with ham operators, GMRS, and our uh, transportation and public works radio system to be able to respond better to disasters in case of fire, flooding, or anything else. How's that? I think that's a, that's a summary. We're available to answer any questions that you may have. All right, thank you, Johannes. Uh -huh. any, any questions from council members? Sorry, I'm trying to get back to a, a gallery view and I'm, there we go. So I can see people. Yes, Council Member Dickey. Um, question about Rule 20 uh, and their projects. Is Highway 12 a county? Um, do you have authority over that roadway or with the state? That is a state route. Right, so, so have, that would not question. count against the money that you've, uh, that you've been allocated, would it not? No, no. Okay. Um, we have we have no jurisdiction over Highway 20, even right. though we work with good with the state. We partner, especially when we have dual jurisdiction intersections. Uh, we work together with them. Um, so it, it's going to be largely like residential areas, correct? I mean, like along the Drone Road or along Arnold Drive, where. Right. Would, okay. Those kinds yeah. of areas then, huh? Yeah. And you're yes. going to probably identify longer, larger roadways to, so you can, you know, make the dollars go more efficiently, I assume. 
Yes. Would you like to participate in the in the selection of project? Sounds like you know a lot about him. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> I have a pretty full plate at the moment. There you go. Okay. All right. Thanks. However, I might in the future. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> and then, and so, you know, in combination with that question, it would seem to me that if you were going to improve a roadway, if you were going to do a pavement, a pavement preservation project in an area, would it not make sense to do the undergrounding for communications or uh, infrastructure repair and undergrounding at the same time? It, it does. <clears throat> in most cases, it does. In some, in, in other cases, it doesn't matter because the undergrounding is to, may be outside of the paving structure. So it doesn't matter. Like, for example, we're doing one in Freestone where we just finished paving and the undergrounding would be outside of the paving prism of the paving section. What we're looking at, it's in the future to, in addition to undergrounding PG&E, and, and cable, no, not cable, PG&E and phone is what we have, undergrounding for broadband. And, and that's something that we're working on and trying to figure out how to fund that. So that leads me to my second question regarding infrastructure. Is So Highway 12 being a state highway, we can't get expanded um, broadband into the valley from Santa Rosa because, you know, through the county because it would be a state a state authority is that would that be correct so if we wanted to bring you know sonic for instance is expanding uh -huh. their you know their distribution right uh -huh. and, uh, and <clears throat> i'm wondering do they have to get authority from the state in order to work along highway 12 do they have an agreement with you so that you can do it and would that be part of what we could anticipate here in the valley because broadband is pretty iffy you know yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. So typically how that happens is uh, Sonic would get an encroachment permit with the state. And when they get an encroachment permit, and there's several different ways of doing it. You have a franchise agreement with the jurisdiction or right. with Caltrans, you have an encroachment permit process and, and they allow, you know, work. If they're only crossing, it's a lot easier if they're crossing the, the state route rather than being parallel to the state route. I'm not familiar with the regulations on what the state allows and where within the road right away but that is something that they can work out with uh, with the state is that a long process to work Ooh. inside the franchise yeah. easements yes oh yeah yeah thank you yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. council member newhauser thank you um yeah, just a few questions. Just a clarification. Um, I believe you said you had 21 or 29 million credits um, and 4 uh, million credits per mile. So does that mean, is that like about eight miles for the whole county? Or what are we looking at as far as the available credits for undergrounding utilities? What does that translate to miles? It's really... It, it, there's really not a one-to-one -one match because every project is different, right? So one project, there could be a project that is one mile. There's, you know, not too many driveways and we have, you know, there's not too much complexity on the project. So the cost might be cheaper than if you have a, pro a project where it's, the area is densely populated, you have to go through a lot of driveways, cut a lot of road and repave and all that. So it really varies, mm -hmm. but we have, we have, uh, about 21 and a half million with an option to get four more from Caltrans. The county receives about, I mean, from, from uh, PG&E, the county receives about 765,000 uh, credits annually. Um, now, the, the uncertainty with the Rule 28 uh, program overall is that uh, the, C the CPUC may sunset the program in 2030. We've heard rumors that, that, that that's going to happen. Uh, they were going to make a decision by April 1st this year. Um, I just got an email that they may be postponing that to August of 2021. So what we want to do is we want to get ahead of the curve, have all the projects selected and, and be ready. Should they sunset the program, at least we have all the projects and the undergrounding districts created so we can go ahead and, and put the projects through the pipe and get them done. 
but, but the number you quoted was for the whole county, correct? For the whole county. Well, okay. that, this is for the unincorporated area. Cities okay. get their own uh, Rule 20A allocation. So, so if, you know, if you're going to divvy it up, it's just going to be a mile or so per district, um, um, depending on the costs involved. So anyway, I, just to be realistic about what the expectations are, yeah. Um, my only suggestion regarding that is that, that you look at uh, vulnerability to fire. I mean, this is a huge issue with lines coming down. I know when I had to escape in, in 2017, mm -hmm. there, the poles were completely burned out and the, um, and the power lines were dangling in the road. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I, you know I, I'm, it's unfortunate that it's regarded as being an aesthetic choice uh, because it should be more one of where it's crucial for fire safety and evacuation. Um, and I had just another couple of um, quick questions um, uh, and a comment. But the other question was uh, going back to Ms. Thompson's um, uh, uh, presentation and uh, the lack of funding and the, <laughs> the, the few roads that will be repaired in the coming year. Um, is the state or is the county lobbying the state for a greater allocation of funds for uh, county road improvements and maintenance? So Mark, before, let me see if I can uh, address one of, the, of your concerns. The first one, um, I agree with you on the rule 20. We, we, we've worked with, this, with the CPUC, the county got ahead of this early on. Uh, we've been, we have consultants and I've been going to San Francisco me with the CPUC to try to change the rules mm -hmm. and regulations of Rule 20 to include fire areas, and and that's not happening. We have we haven't been successful there yet, but I can tell you that when we're looking at, for example, we're doing the Freestone project, that happens to be in the county on a high risk fire area, and it meets the requirements of the Rule 28. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to kill two birds with with one stone where we can, mm -hmm. and uh, we're really paying paying attention to that. Um, so, Thank you. yeah, and then not to jump on Janice's uh, reply, but the allocation that we got, we get from the state for road funds um, is fixed and it was fixed many years ago. It's, mm -hmm. it's a combination of registered vehicles on road miles um, and we can't change it. Tip, uh, it. There's a lot of controversy over it. I'll just give you some, you know, bites that I've, uh, like I've learned throughout the years, there's a lot of controversy because the, the formula is geared to Southern California and highly, high, you know, highly populated areas. LA County gets, the, you know, the most of all the money and, and, the, and the pot. So that's kind of yeah. how we are with, with funding. That's why it's so important to have Measure M and SB1, which are really, really beneficial to us. And it gives us a, a lot of more freedom and flexibility for, for road work. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Sorry, just Janice. a quick comment, unless Jens, did you want to add anything to that? No, I was just going to say, Mark, what, what Johanna said. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. You're in agreement. Um, the, the other one's just a kind of a, a, a small thing, but it, it's one that affects a lot of us here in Glen Ellen. And that is when roads are, um, maintained and or uh, sealed after repairs like they did between Glen Ellen and say Ago Caliente on Arnold Drive. Um, they came back and they put down a really coarse chip seal uh, using a, a larger than normal aggregate. And it, it's funny because the comments I'm getting is like, well, when are they going to finish the road? And, and this was done a few years ago, granted, but it's it, it stayed in that condition. So my only request is this, is to require a smaller uh, size aggregate in their chip seal, because that okay. is, it ended up being really coarse and I, who knows why, but it, it's, yeah. it's, it's loud, it's rough. Um, you know, yeah. we, we can't all afford a, a Mercedes. So. Yeah, that's a good point, Mark. <laughs> we, we, well, that's a good point, Mark, we've heard it. Um, uh, chip seals can be loud, so we we're trying to stay away from chip seals in the future if we can. Um, mm. We uh, we've heard complaints from they heard my doggies paws to oh. their loud <laughs> to a lot, you know. So we we understand it's one tool that we have 
but we have to be mindful where we use it. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other um, questions or comments? Yes, uh, Council Member Nardo Morgan. Um, yeah, Johannes, I, I agree with Mark on this. I mean, power lines are really dangerous and they pose an even greater risk uh, during fire season. I live near Mark and experienced all the things he was talking about with the live wires down. Um, I know there are other communities, not in our county, but uh, other communities in California who have successfully buried power lines. Uh, is there anything that we can do as a community or even as, as, as the MAC to help expedite this or in any way, you know, make this easier or are there, do you have any, mm -hmm. anything we can do? Yeah, so rule 20A is one way of doing it, right? Working with PG&E. Um, there's another program that it's called, it's rule 20, there's rule 20A, rule 20B and rule 20C. I'm also working in the Larkfield Wikiup area and I'm trying to get a rule 20B project going. Rule 20B is not funded by taxpayers. It's funded by either development or any other private funding source. That's another way to do it. Um, those are the two that I know. You know, you have a developer on the ground when they develop a parcel or a property. Um, other than that, you are probably going to be doing mostly Rule 20 unless you have a huge funding source that just wants to go on underground utilities. Uh, countywide, which is when no, normally doesn't happen. Um, we know how important it is to have um, for, for, for safety on the grounding of the poles. You know, I've been out in all the fires. I've been, and I can tell you that sometimes we go in one way and the poles, because of the, I don't, I don't know if it's creosote anymore, but of the coating that the poles have, they burn very slow and they burn from the bottom. And when we go in to try to clear up a road, when we go out, sometimes the pole has burned, the bottom at least, and it's hanging on the side of the road. So I've been with our guys where we have to cut the pole out and go PG&E. So they're not, they're not you know, the best option, but I can tell you that in remote areas, it's gonna be very, very difficult to, like, like the road, for example, the glass fire, it's very, very difficult to underground those utilities you probably see more undergrounding in more densely populated areas. Oh, I'm not, I know that probably didn't make you happy, but that's kind of like the reality that we have. We would love to underground, just so you know. We try to move, make the push. We try to change the program uh, so it would include fire you know, prone areas, but um, the CPUC and, PG, and pg and &E are not moving on that. It'd be great to get um, uh, you know local generation with solar panels, you know, so if, so we don't have these lines going all over the place. There you go. That would help. Yeah. yeah. I think Supervisor Gorin had a um, had a comment or a question. Well, I'm going to put Johannes on the spot. He knows that I love to do that. Um, and <laughs> so, Johannes, um, of interest to the entire village of Glen Ellen is the repaving of the decking of the two bridges. And you and I have had conversations about that. And I think you were going to check on that, but uh, maybe Janice knows. Uh, so when can we get the decking on the bridges replaced? So Supervisor Gorin, uh, thank you for putting me on the spot. I like to be put on the spot. I think it gives, me, uh, gives you young and energetic. So typically, we used to, just so you know, we used to pave uh, bridge decking, right? And we used to pave that. and. Uh, Throughout the years, we've learned that when you have a concrete deck and you pave on top of it, you're adding weight. There's moisture that gets trapped in between uh, the two layers of different materials. So what we've done is we've stopped, uh, most of the bridges, we've stopped paving them. And what we do is we grind them. We may add a one inch polyester concrete layer on top of the deck, or we may met, uh, use something else called methacrylate and methacrylate the deck and preserve it. I, I know that we have, that is a bridge maintenance program project that we're working on and Janice can elaborate on that, but we have about 15 or 16 bridges that we're getting funding to methacrylate countywide and this project's maybe there. So Janice, is that, 
How's that? Yeah, I'll just add that um, we are ready to go, Supervisor Gorin. We have 24 bridges mm -hmm. ready to go. Um, and I hate to throw Caltrans under the bus, but um, <laughs> Uh, they oh. don't have their <laughs> they don't have their funding available. So mm -hmm. we've missed it for this season. We continue to work with them to fund our projects. We're ready to mm -hmm. go as soon as we get Caltrans funding. That'll happen. I know that the uh, Arnold Drive bridge over Sonoma Creek in downtown Glen Ellen is in that. What is your other bridge? Uh, now what's it's called the Jim Berkland Bridge, which is the bridge oh, yeah. um, straddling uh, the uh, Sonoma Developmental Center. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to check if that bridge is in the uh, project we have ready to roll. And I'll get back to you. I, I was so excited. You were just leading into good news. Mm -hmm. And then, well, uh, I have you two, know. I have two more for you, Supervisor Gorin. Uh, the Arnold Dr uh, Drive bike lane that was my uh, next RF question. <laughs> RFP request for proposals for design is being advertised. So we're probably gonna be uh, uh, receiving RFPs within the next month to go to design and we're working on the funding for construction. And then the second update is that tomorrow we're pouring the deck on Boys Boulevard Bridge. Uh, if you guys wanna see that tomorrow, eight o'clock we're pouring. Um, there, I'm gonna be out there with the drone taking some really cool pictures and and a few other ones, so should be a good time. Well, send those photos my way. It's been we a long will. two will. years for yes. the Spring community to bypass uh, Boys Boulevard. I'm excited mm -hmm. to hear about that. And just for everybody's amusement, I've been working on the widening of the Arnold Drive for now eight years. <laughs> <laughs> you need yeah. patience in my yeah. position and a little <laughs> exasperation but every time I have a conversation with Johannes I say okay my last question is <laughs> so yay you jumped right to the bottom line thanks Johannes I really appreciate that <laughs> got some more eagles um, I have to defer to Council Member Doss, who's had his hand up patiently for a long oh, time. Do, do you want to go, Council Member Doss, and I'll follow you if you still have a comment or a question? Yeah. Well, I thank you. Thank you. Um, there sounds like at least several buckets of money, but as I understand it, the fire, the PG&E money is to be dedicated to those roadways that were either damaged in the fire or in the cleanup. Is, is that the case? That is correct for tier one and tier one plus. So how do you determine the priorities on those, those roads? Uh, how does how that done? Is that through a commission or through the no. department or? So that, by the way, that's a good question. This, and, and uh, we had a really good discussion and session with the board on this, on this road segments. This road segments were not selected by the department. The, the haulers and the contractors selected the projects for us, the road segments. During 2017, when there was mayhem trying to clear properties and everything was going at 100 miles per hour, everyone took their own route. Trucks were being, as you know, there were trucks overloaded and they damaged road. There was a few accidents. So we were, the county was asking for where are your hauling, hauling routes to the contractors all along we never got the routes it was uh it was disappointing but things happen and we couldn't keep up with it so what we did is we follow the trucks and we base everything on following the trucks complaints received by the department from residents from the office of supervisor gorens and we kept a log of all these roads that were damaged when we were done we came to fema and we gave them a list of over 80 something million dollars and they said sure we're gonna we're, we'll pay for this because we had talked to them right after the fires and we knew what was coming so they promised that they were going to do they were going to you know verbally they agreed that they were going to do this when when time came to do it they rejected the appeal so we had a list of all the projects and all the damage that happened on all the roads at one point they asked us to reduce that claim uh, to, to $20 million, and we did, and we selected the worst damage product, uh, segments. Um, they rejected that, and then 
that that became tier one, which is a 20 million, it's 20, 21 million uh, claim that we submitted. And then when we have the pg and &E settlement now, we went to the second tier or tier one plus, which were the next, you know, damage received uh, roads. There's more, there's some that we're gonna have to address longer term with our road funding and all that, but this is probably the worst uh, road segments. And that, those dollars are totally separated from the dollars that Janice was talking yes. about. Okay, just trying to understand yeah. uh, where the money comes from. Thank yes. you. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank you, Council Member Eagles, for noticing me. <laughs> I saw your little hand there. So yeah, Council Member Eagles, and then we'll, we'll go to Council Member Handron. Okay, so so quick question on the on the bike path on Arnold Drive. Then I have another question. Where where are the cross streets on that? That the, the, the next phase of this project will go to, um, on Arnold. That's a good question, Janice. You remember that? Yeah, I think it's from um, Country Club is the south border, and then north to uh, Loma Vista. Okay. Essentially, Kate, it is about a half mile north and a half mile south of the roundabout at Hannah Boy Center. Um, my predecessor, Valerie Brown, started uh, the widening of Arnold Drive, and I'm going to need your help because it will involve tree cutting. Some of the eucalyptus trees, they need to be gone anyway. They're flam flaming torches. But uh, some of the neighbors are going to be unhappy uh, with uh, the trees coming down. Uh, she gave up on the rest of the widening of Arnold Drive because of the neighborhood opposition. So indeed, I will need your help. We do need to make Arnold Drive safer for cyclists, especially as we look forward to redeveloping the Sonoma Developmental Center. We need to create safe, multimodal transportation. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, my other question may be a more co complex one. Thank you for that. That's really good to know. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled about that actually. Um, the, my other question, how, how, because of different pots of money and some of the timelines are fairly protracted because there's not enough money, how does the community appropriately weigh in and how do you talk to them about timelines and priorities? Um, just in terms of people listening and as we talk to our community constituents, can someone comment a little bit about that? Um, I know you take on board what people say, but it could be, you know, quite a few years, correct? Um, so, uh, Supervisor Gorney, if you don't mind, I'll start, and then Janice and you go. So, so Kate, we have for the pavement preservation program, we go to the board every two years to select the projects and start working on design. For first, we go out to the field, assess the road segment, determine what type of maintenance we're going to do, and then we do the sign, then we put the plans and the specs. So it takes a long time to get the projects from, from the list of projects to, to a bidding product, right, going out to, to construction. That, so we have about a two-year window. Now it's a good opportunity to start getting feedback and start getting when you call your supervisor, when you call our office or, leave or put a complaint all that is being logged. And when we go out to put that list of projects, we reach out to Supervisor Goring, the community, the service requests that we have received, all the complaints, and we put them in, you know, we have a list and then we select the projects. So it takes about two years to, for all that to happen, um, to do it, you know, right and how we do it. So that's why it takes so long to do it. Now, the, the $58 million for PG&E uh, part of it is going to become part of the pavement preservation program, which is cool because we're just plugging them in in those two years. And I say it's cool because I like to have more money to pave, but Janice is going crazy with all that money and projects and figuring out how to get them out, you know, on the ground. So it's a good problem to have, but it is logistically, you know, it takes a lot of work. Some of the other work, it's going to be probably long term. We're going to have to design retaining walls. We have, you know, uh, what else are we doing? Culverts and all those projects. And those may take one, two, three years to build just because of the environmental regulations that we have. I learned a pretty cool term today. Uh, when it, we norm, we're used to red tape when it comes to bureaucracy of government. When it comes to environmental regulations, we see a lot of green tape. And, <laughs> and there's a lot of that going around. So. Does that answer kind of your question? I'll let Janice and Supervisor Gorin go with. 
Yeah. And, and I would just add, it's my expectation and hope that a couple of members of each of the MAC uh, in the Springs and the Glen Ellen North Sonoma Valley uh, Municipal Advisory Council uh, would volunteer to help us uh, look at roads for future uh, repaving in the years to come. We could not open it up this year because Janice is saying, no, have to take it to the board <laughs> like next month or the following month. No, we can't have a lot of community weigh in. Mm -hmm. But trust me, the community does weigh in. Uh, our district, Pat Gilardi, is a whiz at spreadsheets, and she keeps mm -hmm. a spreadsheet of every comment from a community member, pave my road, pave my road, and she adds it to the spreadsheet. So when it comes time for the two-year road paving project, uh, Janice comes to say, here are our suggestions. Here's what the crews are seeing as the needs for road repaving. And we have an enormous district. And so I say, okay, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, and a lot in the springs uh, because we have not really repaved many of the roads in the village of Glen Ellen or in the springs mm -hmm. for 40 or 50 years. So um, I'm trying to get the road money down to the local level for all of mm -hmm. you and Janice is doing an amazing job, but even when she brings the, the plan forward to us, we say, no, not that. There's not enough traffic on that road. Shift that to the neighborhood roads. Uh, so she's, and, and we pull our hair out and say, what do you mean we only get $4 million? I don't think so. <laughs> so right. she's, she, and every supervisor has that conversation with her. It's very frustrating to try to repave the roads um, with a very limited budget that we have. However, because of you, the voters, uh, in your reauthorization of Measure M through the Sonoma County Transportation Authority, when that is, when that turns over in 2024, a larger percentage of that funding can be and will be devoted to neighborhood roads. So we hope over the next five or six years that you can help us develop a program to start looking at those roads now so that Janice's job is easier saying, okay, here's what we heard a couple of years ago. Is it still relevant? And I have an enormous thick binder that's outdated with all of the pavement condition index of each of the roads in Sonoma County, but specifically my district as well. So it's one of the indicators that the roads crews and Janice uses to go down and look at the pavement condition and say, yeah, that road is way past ready to be repaved. And I believe we just approved a contract to update uh, that PCI uh, index. So uh, that should be forthcoming in another year. And I fully expect what they will say to us is not only are they failing roads, they are failed roads. Uh, and it's pretty much a lot of our neighborhood roads I think the pavement condi uh, condition index ranges to 50 maybe, Janice, and a lot yeah. of our roads yep. in, in the municipal areas are zero to four. That gives you some idea of the challenge we have navigating on those roads and how poor they really are. So when someone says, my road hasn't been paved in 40 years, I said, yeah, you're right. No one's roads pretty much mm -hmm. have been paved. Okay, this is your Supervisor Gordon. Um, uh, okay. I have a quick question. Um, after after saying all that, I would say that I've heard some people refer as council members, and I think I'm assuming that's the city of Sonoma, um, or this, this municipal this the municipal advisory oh, the council. Municipal. Okay. Yeah. So ha so having said that, sometimes when the city of Sonoma or one of the other cities come to us and there's a project that is financially beneficial for both jurisdictions and it's in the boundary of the county and the city, um, sometimes we can partner with them and it doesn't take two years. They do most of the work. Sometimes we fund the projects and we've done that with the city of Sonoma and, and, and other cities in the county. So we're a, we're a rural district here, so we don't, we don't have the, that advantage, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah. And uh, uh, Council Member Handren's been patiently waiting. Um, yeah, just a really quick question. That FEMA rejection of the the um, 
the $20 million is the latest offer. Is that a final rejection or is it appealable or? It's, a, it's appealable and we are wanting the final rejection and FEMA has uh, delayed, they, they normally have 30 days to, to reply. I think they're on uh, about six plus months to reply. Oh, wow. Um, so they haven't replied. And just so you know, um, FEMA, like Caltrans, when they do a project in a jurisdiction, they are not responsible for the damage caused by the hauling or the, you know, the trucking or anything like that to local roads. That is not in their program. So it is very odd. And that's why we went and met with them early on during the fire. But they're not doing anything that it's not common for them um i just I'm, I'm not sure why they haven't rejected it straight out and call it good um, but we need that um for the board to make the decision to move with tier one uh, projects and then I, my next question might not be it might be more of a caltrans question do you handle um the allocation of lanes on roads you know what's a turning lane and what's a straight lane and things like that on, on, so on county roads, we do. Okay, so there's the, I've had a few people talk to me about the intersect, the northbound intersection of Arnold Drive and Madrone Road it's that has a left-hand turn lane and a straight lane. And the vast majority of traffic goes straight or makes a right-hand turn. So is it possible to reallocate those lanes? So give us the intersection again, and we'll, we will uh, we can evaluate the intersection. Okay, it's uh, Arnold Drive Arnold at Drive the intersection Madrone. of Madrone. Okay. On the um, the southern side of the intersection, as you're traveling north on Arnold Drive, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. South Lake. So there's a left-hand turn lane that goes up a, to a residential area that has very few cars turning left on that at that intersection. Okay, so what have you noticed? Delays or collisions or? Um, delays, yeah. Delays. During commute times, it gets backed up because cars, and, and if there was a, a right-hand turn lane and a straight lane, it would really help the flow of traffic go much more smoothly because that's, that's how traffic flows at that intersection. Okay, we will look at it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Councilmember Handron. Um, I have some questions about um, um, <laughs> downtown Glen Ellen. Um, I, my office is downtown Glen Ellen, and, and um, you know it's a it's a weird intersection. You guys, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, with the three roads coming in, and and it's a really long crosswalk. And and uh, every time I cross the mark cross the street to go to the market from my office, I've, I feel like I have to be really careful and kind of assertively walk out there like a somebody with a six gun, practically, you know to um, so I, uh, you know, it's, it's complicated. I understand that. I'm wondering, um, well, well, two things. One is, um, how complicated would it be to get, uh, one of those flashing crosswalk, uh, indicators? Uh, cause I've noticed that it, it can be hard to see somebody ready to cross the road as you're coming along Arnold. It's not, you know, there's vegetation, there's a turn, there's all kinds of stuff going on. So if there's some kind of a little, I don't want a traffic light. I don't think anybody else would want that either, but just some kind of a, uh, flashing crosswalk light to let drivers know that there's somebody, uh, you know, crossing the street or about to cross the street. Um, yeah, how, what, what would be involved in, in sort of getting that? Uh, sure, so, so first I, we, would, we would analyze the intersection and see if there's anything that, it's, uh, that we can enhance. Typically when we work on traffic issues, we start with the least restrictive measures first. Um, so I don't know the type of crosswalk that you have or the side distance, but we would look at the side distance, the, Christ, the type of crosswalk, the visibility. Maybe we go from a, well, they have, what they call a continental crosswalk, which is the two wide lines, and then we'll put a, a ladder type and increase visibility. And we'll go and, and increase that. Normally, there's a history of collisions or accidents or something at the intersection. If there's not, then it's assumed that the measures are working and everything it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, what, 
changing the, the striping and, and making a, a crosswalk ladder, it's not too big, you know, it's no big deal other than the, the, the time and the money to do the work. Um, when we go to um, some type of flashing beacon, then that's, you know, that's more involved. Uh, there's maintenance, there's cost of installation and maintenance in perpetuity. So sometimes we, sometimes that's what you need to do. But if we don't have, we don't install anything that we don't have to, because it's the cost and you know road maintenance and maintaining those things in perpetuity. But but we can look at the intersection and determine what it, you know any enhancements that we can do. How could I find out what the accident uh, record is for that intersection? So we have, you can try to contact Caltrans, or we have we can check that information is not public, but we we get collision reports. And, and we document the county as a whole. We get all the collisions that happen in the unincorporated area of uh, Sonoma County. And on Friday, I sit down about three o'clock and I start reading fatalities. Mm -hmm. By five o'clock, I'm drinking and I'm passed out because of all the depression of all the collisions that I've seen and people drinking, driving, using drugs and driving into trees and dying and horrible, horrible. But we get him and we have to read him and see what we can fix from an engineering perspective, right? So we get them and we can do a check on how many collisions have been at this intersection. And that's how we, that's how we treat that. Yeah, council member uh, Nardo Morgan. Well, Arthur, and I just wanted to say there was a woman seriously injured in an accident there, Evelyn, who used to work at the bank. So oh, oh yeah, right. Yeah, so let me add yeah. something real quick before we go into that. There so there's, this is from a traffic perspective. There are correctable collisions and there are non-correctable collisions. We can correct issues that are either through engineering, uh, we can correct. We cannot correct a drunk driver, for example, or a distracted driver. We cannot correct those collisions. So what we can correct, engineering can treat it. And then we have the three E's of, in, of traffic, and we have the engineering, the enforcement, and the education. And we can educate people, we can uh, do engineering, and Highway Patrol does the enforcement. Thanks, yeah, that all makes sense. Well, I'll, um, yeah, I'll probably contact you and find out what the- Sure, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm especially aware of it because I live across, I work across the street from the market and I cross that intersection mm -hmm. every day, you know, and it's, uh, yeah. you know, I've seen a couple of close calls there. Yeah, um, yeah and the other question I had was, um, you know, the downtown bridge, it's, it's uh, over 80 years old now. And uh, as a historian, I'm aware that the last bridge lasted about 50 years and then was replaced. So I'm just thinking, well, uh, well, first of all, yeah, does it get inspected for uh, structural integrity? And, um, and then how long should we expect the current bridge to last? Uh, bridges get inspected every two to three years by Caltrans. I don't know if they're done to four now, but they get inspected by the state, all our bridges, um, in addition to the road maintenance and the inspections that we do. Um, and a bridge, like you say, we typically design them, well, they use it for about 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, that really means uh, 100 years or plus, you know. Um, so a new bridge, we design it for about 75 plus years. Um, I, so I don't know where we are on that on your downtown bridge, but but that's a good thing. If the fact that I don't know, that's a good thing. That means uh -huh. no one yeah, working yeah. on it is structurally sound, and we're not we don't have we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I mean I like the bridge. I don't want to see it replaced, yeah. but but it does occur right. to me that it's it's getting old. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm some most cases we can we don't have to replace it. There may depending on how it's functionally obsolete or structurally deficient. And there's a lot of criteria that we go, we may not have to replace it. We may rehab the bridge and keep the character of the community. All right, thank you. Um, yeah. Any other um, questions from council members? And then we'll move into to public comment when you, the public has questions. Yeah, council member Newhauser. All right, you're on. Uh, did, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, regarding that, I think it's Linda Ranch Road and, uh, and Arnold Drive that Arthur was referring to. Um, uh, would please consider uh, some kind of traffic calming device 
um, whether you know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's there's lots of different ways yeah. of doing that. Yeah. Uh, that might be really helpful. Uh, I understand putting in any kind of electrified um, lighting system for a yeah, crosswalk yeah, yeah. is expensive and et cetera. Right. But but there are other things that can be done. Um, yeah. Because you know, they're trying to make that more user-friendly, pedestrian-friendly. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing regarding this uh, lack of accountability with uh, FEMA and their hired uh, these out-of-state contractors that come in, and basically it's the wild, wild west. I mean, they, these trucking firms came in, and they I witnessed a lot of the damage that was done on private roads um, mm -hmm. by uh, t traffic right after storms. Um, you know, just liquefying uh, driveways and destroying property. Um, and I, I can't help but think that if, if the county, if they don't have any um, legal recourse through FEMA, couldn't they have it through the private firms on, and could the county put weight restrictions and timing according to uh, the elements and, you know, like uh, the wetness and um, you know, putting some kind of restrictions on when they do the work so that they minimize the impacts to the roads. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to comment on was um, the, uh, the bridges. Uh, there's a lot of concern about failing bridges, whether it be um, due to earthquake or fire or, um, and that's a big concern um, that if these fail that they're, we're going to lose egress because there's in many of the areas within uh, Glen Ellen and Kenwood and even Oakmont, there's only one way in and one way out. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's something that, anyway, but uh, if you could respond regarding the, the trucking issue and the lack of accountability, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, Mark, so some of the, half of your question I think is legal, so I'm not even gonna step on a, on a legal, you know, whether we can go after them legally. I do know that the roads are, <clears throat> uh, the roads are public. Um, you you cannot restrict that type of traffic on on you know on public roads. We get the same argument when we have timber harvesting plants and stuff like that. As long as they're legal loads, they have the right to travel the mm. the the public right of way. So that's where it's difficult. Of course, we can make things difficult for them if uh, if we have noticed that this is going to happen. Uh, we can always close a road for maintenance, quotation marks, uh, when it's actively happening, right, and disrupt the operation. But we're, we're beyond that. Um, on your bridges, we have about, I want to say we have about 14 or 15 bridges that are seismically retrofits now that we're trying to replace or rehab. Um, I think one of them is the Franz Valley Bridge. Uh, is that in this district here? Franz Yes. Not really. Yeah. I mean, it is, but it's uh, so distant. We don't. That's not our community. Yeah. Okay. I was just trying to look for help because we got a meeting with the with that group tomorrow, and, and we can use all the help that, that we can find. <laughs> um, but 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 that's one that we need to replace as well. And and sometimes people get uh, uh, attached to a bridge, mm -hmm. and and sometimes they need to they need to go because, like you say, if you get some good shaking, then you're going to be. Uh, you won't be, we don't have access or egress out of your, your area because your bridge failed. So we, we, don't, we don't enjoy removing bridges with character out of the community, but we love making bridges safer for the community to function better. And sometimes um, we try to do the best that we can with, with the bridge, but sometimes it's, uh, I, I have, a, I have a, a, an engineer that I know um, she's a, she's a woman, she happens to be a woman, very good engineer. And she told me one time that, uh, Johannes bridges are like an old boyfriend. You forget about them and you get over them and get rid of them. So uh, that's, that's how I think sometimes bridges, you got to treat them, forget about them. They, they don't have emotions. They just get rid of them. So, but people get attached. So we have to deal with that. All right, did I answer you. your question, Mark? I hope I did. All right, any other uh, comments or questions from council members? Uh, I'm just noting we're getting up close to an hour and a half. So just, just to note the time here and uh, any questions or comments from the public? 
We do have uh, Katie Chris. Let me pull up my timer here. Uh, okay, so uh, Katie, you should be able to unmute. Welcome, Katie. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, I had brought this up at a prior meeting and I'm not sure if it's in the purview of the county because it's where a county and a state road meet. Um, it's that intersection um, southbound from Highway 12 onto Arnold Drive where <clears throat> the shoulder is marked where it would be safer to have a right-hand turn lane. There was a near fatal accident um, just a few months ago when a Kenwood resident um, was almost killed there by a, um, an out of town driver that was not under the influence, um, <clears throat> but because it was not properly marked. Um, if that is something that could be looked into, that would be great. Thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that uh, the uh, Transportation Public Works is here to hear that, and, and we do have our ad hoc committee on uh, traffic and safety, so um, we will be working with um, the TPW on, on spots like that um, and see what we can do to improve the safety and, and the traffic flow, too. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, any other comments from the public? I'm giving them a minute, but I'm not seeing any other hands. Okay, well, um, then uh, I think we can move on to the next one. Um, and I, I look forward to um, working with TPW as we do have the ad hoc committee for traffic and safety. So at some point when it's appropriate in the future, uh, we'll, you know, we're certainly ready to work with you guys. Um, you know, the ad hoc committees can't last for more than a year. So we'll, we'll figure that out when the time comes, but you know, please, please be in touch when it feels like it's an appropriate time for us to, to uh, give you information about, you know, places that we think should be worked on. Um, all right, so now we're, we're um, the next agenda item is uh, holding a special meeting uh, about the Glen Ellen Triangle. And um, so the idea is, is that uh, would, we, we would appoint an ad hoc to hold a special community meeting. It would just be a short-term ad hoc. Um, and so I guess, uh, well, first we'll have discussion and then we'll, we'll vote to see if we wanna, uh, I, you know, let me, let me start and just see are there, how many people um, potentially would be interested in serving on, on a Glen Ellen Triangle ad hoc? Just raise your hand. Uh, well, <laughs> 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 All right. Well, um, I'm sorry to laugh. If, I don't mean to be um, to diminish it, but we do need to have somebody who's interested in working on it. Um, so, um, any any thoughts on how we can address this, uh, maybe without an ad hoc, or or is there anybody here who would be willing, let's say, in the next six months, to serve on a on a brief on an ad hoc for maybe two or three months just to make that meeting happen? Um, Yeah, uh, Council Member Newhauser. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the issue. I'm, I've also considered what could be done and I know that there's people within the community and um, that are very interested in this. Um, I feel like it's something that the Glen Ellen Forum is very interested in doing. And if, if all they need is a liaison with the county, um, I can provide that role. Um, I, I feel that they're kind of the driver in this project. And I don't know if there's anybody from uh, the representing Glen Ellen Forum. I know Leslie Vaughn has weighed in on this in the past, but I noticed that she's not part of the attendees today. Uh, thank you, Council Member Newhauser. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, Council Member Narda Morgan. I want to say, well, I'm on the board of the forum. I'm, I am leaving, but Melissa is really, you know, 
driving this. She's not here. So I think she might be someone who would probably, I don't want to speak for her, but I think she'd be very interested in being a part of that. Because you're right, Mark, the, the form is really driving this, this project. Mm -hmm. So we might, I mean, I don't know if we want to wait and ask her, but she, she seems like a very likely person that might want to be part, you know, take this on. Possibly. And perhaps uh, what we could do is, was, uh, you know, tell the forum that we're supportive of, of their efforts and, you know, we would, we could somehow, if you want to have a public meeting, we could be co-sponsors or, or at least, you know, we could show up as in support. Yeah, Council Member Newhauser. Question for uh, Angela. It, do you feel that this is something that they, that the folks on, on the forum committee want to do sooner than later? You know, I haven't really heard that much about it because it's part of the projects committee and the projects is running it, but I know that they've already gotten a landscape landscape architect. They're looking at it. I think they're looking at, you know, native plants. Uh, they're, they're really mm -hmm. moving forward with it. So yes. Okay. So it's really more about coordinating with the county and, and maybe- Land um, trust, I think. Land yes. Supervisor Gorn? Right You're mute. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. Uh, thank you for letting me know that the forum is working on this. Could you please have them get in touch with me? Uh, because we have some very specific requirements for that triangle. And it's not going to be a park. It's a parking easement. So there's very limited um, things that the county will allow. And um, the fire department needs it for parking. The county needs it for parking. So we, uh, so have them get in touch with me. Absolutely. And I, I kind of agree with that. I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> there were so many strange iterations of what this was gonna be from a <laughs> skateboard park to a dog park to <laughs> Yeah, no, I think none of those things are going to happen. <laughs> we like to dream big in Glen Ellen. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. Small village, big dreams. <laughs> I'll make sure they get in touch with you. Absolutely. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, I, I, um, so I, I, let's see, do we need to take a vote to uh, sort of pass on the resolution? How does, I'm not sure how that works exactly. Um, if you if you don't want to create an ad hoc right now, which it sounds like you don't, you can always create one at another meeting. Um, it doesn't mean you can't do it later. Um, you know, we do have it on the board as a as a resolution item. So if there was some other resolution you wanted, you know, supporting the Glen and Forum or something, I mean, you you can do that. Um, but. You, there's no there's no reason to do a resolution if you're not forming the ad hoc. Okay, um, well, let's hear from the public if there's anyone that wants to speak, and then we'll we'll wrap this one up. Uh, I am not seeing any hands. I'm going to give it a minute. Giving it a minute. Okay, uh, no one no one is enthusiastic about the triangle tonight. So um, now, would it be appropriate for us if, if we wanted to hold a vote just to say we we support the forum's efforts, and um, like we're not committing to anything in particular, but we support the forum's efforts to uh, you know work on the triangle? Is that if that makes any difference to to anybody? Uh, but yeah, Councilmember Eagles. I mean, based on what Council Member Newhauser said, could we resolve to to communicate or have have him, you, Mark, be a, a liaison to get back to the county on this? It sounds like that's what has to happen. You know, someone has to talk to the county, and we maybe have that role. Is that worthy of a resolution or a vote? I don't know, but um, that seems to be a good path. If I, yeah. if I may respond to that, um, yeah. I'm more than happy to play that role, but uh, based on what um, Supervisor Gorn just said, I, I get the impression that they could negotiate directly with the county or with her to resolve any uh, requirements that the county has on the land. Fair enough. 
Yep. It, it, do you have a preference, Susan? <laughs> I, I, I would just table this action um, because it doesn't sound like it's appropriate. Let, it, it doesn't sound like you want to work on this. You want the Glen Ellen Forum to work on this. So why don't mm -hmm. I work with the Glen Ellen Forum and then there possibly could be a report coming back to you in the future. Sounds good. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Just go, do we do we need to take any official action or or can we just uh, table this table this for the future? You can yeah. table it. All right. Okay. And then um, the next item on the on the agenda is the Eldridge STC ad hoc. Um, so uh, as we talked about, um, you know that we we took a vote last time, and we think I think uh, four people. Half of us wanted to see it formed in the near future and half wanted to see it formed in the more slightly more distant future. Um, so sh um, let's open it up to discussion about forming the ad hoc and, and people's thoughts on that. And then, um, and then we can see, are there, actually, I'll, let me start again with um, how many people would be interested in, in uh, serving on an SDC ad hoc committee? We've got, we wouldn't necessarily need more than one, but we have at least two, two people, three people, four people. Okay. So uh, we can't have more than three, but uh, that's good. We've got, got people to serve on it. Um, so what are, what are people's thoughts on forming the committee sooner rather than later or vice versa? Yeah. Council member Eagles. Uh, can I ask a question? Does anyone know, I, I should know this, but I, I, I've heard there are three plans to be put out in the not too distant future. So if anyone has that date, would it make sense to gear our comments to once those to, you know, once those plans are out? I'm going to know that day. Well, that's a Supervisor is, Gorin. I think it's the end of this month, but I, it, I'm going to yeah. defer to Supervisor Gorin. I don't know specifically if the alternatives have been totally developed. I think their next meeting with uh, PAT members in April and so I, I suspect the alternatives have not been identified uh, yet. And so there's time to um, focus in, but remember that there is no land use authority of the MAC. And so comments that you make when in fact that happens and we, there will be a community meeting um, should be made potentially as individuals. And so it, it, I don't think there's any reason to rush this forward. Okay, thank you. Um, now we could, we could, you know, if there, we have people willing to serve, we could, the ad hoc could form and then just, just be, um, you know, active as, as needed in the next, whatever we want to say, six months uh, so that it's already set up, kind of ready to roll. Um, so would, would someone like to propose that as a, um, propose that we form the ad hoc committee? Um, okay, so we have, uh, Council Member Dickey has, uh, moves that we form the SDC ad hoc committee and do I have a second on that? Second. Okay. So all in favor of forming the SDC ad hoc committee, um, tonight, uh, Say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, um, so we just need to staff it and we have four people who are who raised their hands. Um, well, here's, a, here's just a thought. Um, since Council Member Newhauser is, has just taken on the liaison for the triangle, perhaps the other three people would, uh, I mean, he's welcome to serve, but I just thought, He's already volunteered tonight. If, if he wants to pull himself out, uh, that's fine. That understandable. Was that sorry? Yes, that's fine. That, that's fine. Okay, so I think we have um, council members Eagles, Dickey, and Nardo Morgan on the STC ad hoc committee. Is that right? Okay, good. And we'll look forward to hearing here in the report when, when the time is right. Okay, so now uh, we're- uh, Sorry, since I'm doing the minutes tonight, can you repeat who's on the ad hoc committee, please? Yeah, the... council members, uh, Eagles, <clears throat> Dickey, and Nardo Morgan. Got it, thank you. 
Okay, now we have um, reports and announcements from council members and ad hocs. And um, I've, I think this was passed along, but you know, last time we spent a lot of time on this, which was, which was good because we were just getting started and people were, you know, we learned a lot about what the ad hocs were, and, were starting and, out with. And I'm sorry, um, it does look like we, we didn't open it to public comment, but we do have Larry Davis, who I think oh. does want to comment on that. Oh, on the Eldridge uh, SDC committee? Yes, I believe so. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, Larry. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, Larry, you can unmute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi, Larry. Can you, welcome. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted I just wanted to mention that I have the same feeling that uh, Susan Gorin does about the market survey that's coming up with these plans, and I'm getting a lot of feedback from people I know that there's not a transparency going on between what the county planning is doing what the planners are doing that are hired by the county and what the public's getting to know. Uh, my understanding is these three plans are three buckets and you're going to be able to talk about changing pieces of each bucket in the final plan. But what's missing, it seems to me, is some input from people that are trying to get into the conversation but seem not to be able to. Uh, so what I'm suggesting is that uh, is there a way to open up your ad hoc meeting to have a discussion about the public participation in the in this uh, design or their ideas about the design to get them involved? I mean, uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, there is a need to come up with some way to fund the retrofit, whatever it is. And uh, in that, we should take into account the needs the social service needs and the demographic needs of Sonoma Valley as a top priority. But it doesn't look like from what I've read of the literature that the needs, either the service needs or the long-term demographic needs of the Sonoma Valley are put in the primary place for this use of this valuable site for the whole valley and particularly for Glen Ellen. And there seems to be some friction about the idea that this is a, a separate economic development entity that would not be incorporated as part of Glen Ellen in any kind of planning way. So then Glen Ellen is a, in a effect a commercial competitor with some sort of shopping area down there at the you know SDC. All of that seems to me to be not being discussed. And I would really like it to be discussed because we're going to be living with this thing the rest of our lives and, and then after. So I'm just asking if the ad hoc can see its mission as being sort of to reach out to the public and get more input and get that input into at least the county or the planners. That's just my thought about that. And I have one thing to suggest, I've been asking people about using uh, training, vocational training as a site there so that we have vocational training there as one way to help all the people in the Valley who need upgrading of their skills and if we had a residential vocational training aspect that could be added to whatever plan we adopt because that's a strong economic motivator for economic development for the underclass, so to speak, or the lower class. Anyway, that's, I just want to put that in there and see if public could come to the ad hoc meeting or something. Thank you, Larry. And I, and I um, you know, the ad hoc committee could certainly hold a public meeting uh, to discuss to uh, talk about STC and public input and all that. Um, yeah, Council Member Eagles. Yeah, thank you. And I, I would welcome any comments from Supervisor Gorin or from Ariel because I, we have a very narrow purview here uh, from the MAC. And so we need to really be clear on what that is. And so I'm a little nervous. I, I would love to have a public meeting, but I don't think we're the ones to do that. And I think that will happen in a different context. And so um, that's my initial thought. Obviously, I, I've, I've only thought about it for a minute, but I, I'm a little, a little uncomfortable, I'll be honest, because because our, our purview is narrow here in this context. Um, other comments from folks? Hey, I, I really appreciate that comment, and you're absolutely right. If uh, there will be a public meeting about this, um, there and I, I, we're not sure yet how it will work out. Similar, probably, to the community workshops that have been held before, probably virtually. And I would just respond to Larry. Larry, send a letter to Permit Sonoma. This is your idea. You want the, your idea on vocational education to be added to the mix. 
that is the way that individuals and groups can add their thoughts to uh, the alternatives uh, that are being developed uh, now. All right, thank you. Yeah, and thanks and Councilman I, I, Eagles for keeping us on track there with the, with our purview. Yeah, and I would add that as, as the NAC and as the representatives of the community, you can certainly, you know, if, if the ad hoc does end up wanting to write a letter, right, which would come back before this board, this body to be, you know, approved. Oh, I think I froze, I think I froze, okay. Um, it would come back before the body to be approved. You know, it's, it's certainly appropriate to share what you've heard from the community, but I, I also agree that perhaps hosting a large public meeting isn't really, um, you know, so, so folks coming in and doing public comment like Larry just did, I mean, you can include things you've heard um, as, because you are a representative of the community. All right, thanks, Ariel. And I have one question for Supervisor Gorin. Um, you know, certainly one of the concerns is all the toxic waste out there <laughs> that we've heard about. Um, is there any chance of getting it classified as a Superfund site and getting federal money to oh my clean it? <laughs> You're mute. You're mute. Added, it'll just be added to the other 3,000 Superfund sites uh, in the United States. We are talking about the state level versus the federal level. And there, it hasn't yet been determined what the level of hazardous materials there may be on the site. There may be some. Uh, and uh, certainly you would know that because of your research into the historic activities of the SDC, but I, I think that's, let's not um, put the cart before the horse. Let's actually understand what the alternatives are. And I think any future negotiation with the community or a developer team will certainly hinge on whether or not the state is able to contribute some amount of money to repair the infrastructure or potentially clean up hazardous materials if they are identified. The WRT report really did not get down into detail about exploring what's under the ground. And so there's still a lot of investigation to be concluded regarding that site. So stay tuned and don't get real excited about development anytime soon. It's gonna take a very long time. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, any other comments? All right, I think we can move on now to um, reports and announcements. And like I said, um, last time it was great to have, you know, extended uh, reports, or, but in the interest of time, we're gonna um, request people keep their reports to three minutes. And if, you know, I just, uh, we'll see how it goes tonight, but if, if this is sort of how we approach things, then of course, any ad hoc committee that has an issue that needs more time can ask to have it put on the agenda and then it'll, you know, it won't be limited to, to a few minutes. Um, so we thought this was one way to, to keep things a little bit tighter. Um, so um, let's start with uh, the Snow Valley Citizens Advisory Council and uh, report from Matt Dickey. Hello everybody. Um, so last month's meeting, um, we reviewed an application for a pop-up restaurant and catering business in the old Olive and Vine location at the, what I call the grist mill. I think it's now London Village. Um, we unanimously, unanimously supported the, the proposal. Um, the young woman lives locally. And uh, um, so you can look forward to in the next, I think in a very brief time, they'll have um, restaurant opportunities and her catering business out of that location. Um, we reviewed a small winery location out on, on Burndale Road, which we also unanimous, unanimously supported. Um, I wanna to bring to your attention the cannabis dispensary in the commercial building at the, com at the corner of Madrone and Arnold Drive is now up for review. Um, and if you support or do not support it, um, wanna encourage you to make your comments known to permit Sonoma. Um, Amazon Warehouse, uh, at the 
corner of 8th Street East and 116. Um, we reviewed that application uh, last year. Um, I commented at the time that I thought it was a disingenuous application. It appears that Permit Sonoma has um, supported that view. Um, and I wanna remind people that just because it's so far away, it does not mean that we will not be impacted by the tra traffic that is generated by this large facility that's being proposed. Um, and so again, you have an opportunity as individuals to comment on proposals of this sort, and I encourage you to do so. Um, the winery events guideline, our, uh, the ad hoc committee for that is still ongoing. There was a workshop that was presented by Permit Sonoma on the 18th of February, 200 people participated. 50% of them were from the wine industry. Um, um, we as an ad hoc committee uh, on a monthly basis prepare our comments as we prepare our own guideline proposals for the Sonoma Valley. Um, and, uh, um, in deference to time, if you're interested in those comments, I can send you the minutes from the meeting that we had last month. And, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Three minutes on the debt. Um, let's see. Uh, um, since, uh, put, should... Oh, just as a comment, Arthur, you may want to put the, uh, the time thing up on somehow so that we can monitor it as we go. Um, yeah, we or at least interrupt will... us if we start to go over. Yeah, you know I, what I told Ariel is, um, let's see how it goes, and if it if it gets up to about five minutes, then I'll I'll uh, jump in and say, you know, that's that's enough. <laughs> but uh, uh, let's let's see how we self police first. I'd rather do it that way than than um, have the clock up. But we will if we need to. Um, so next, I have uh, Glen Ellen Forum. Since Melissa's not here, um, Council Member Nardo Morgan, do you want to? Um, is there any more you'd like to tell us about the forum at this point? Um, I was not at the last meeting. Oh, no, I was at the last meeting. Um, there was uh, Stephen Sorkin who came in and talked a little bit about the building uh, that the garden court and the mercantile um, sounds really wonderful. And um, the really exciting thing that was happening around that is that um, a young woman uh, artist is going to be painting a mural on the side of the building um, that depicts Glen Ellen. So that's going to be her name is I think Maria de Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh -huh. she's really wonderful. I'm actually going to meet with her tomorrow night. Uh, and it just sounds like a really exciting project. So that'll be a fun thing for our town, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I talked to her last week. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to, to see that happen. Yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, next is communications ad hoc. So that's I'll I'll take that one. That's uh, myself, Council Member Handrin, and Council Member Dowling. And so we've been um, making some progress. Um, Council Member Handrin is, is working on the Facebook page. So uh, we'll have that. Uh, I'm not sure what the timeline is on that, but we're, we're working towards that. Do, it's, do you want it's, to up and it's up and oh, it is up. Okay, running. And great. everybody, please join the group. OK. <laughs> and if anybody wants to be an administrator, I'm happy to make them a group administrator. Great, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be good for communications. Um, I contacted, we're, we're, each one of us is contacting, uh, trying to contact at least one community group each month and then have a meeting with them and have a, a listening session. So I, I contacted uh, Valley of the Moon uh, Alliance and I'm gonna meet with them uh, next week. Uh, I'm gonna attend their meeting and just uh, mostly you know tell them about the MAC and then just hear what their concerns are. Um, I've also mentioned uh, the MAC to the Kenwood Ed Foundation. I'm on the, the board there. Uh, so at some point I'll, I'll be, um, you know, asked for some time at, at the, one of their meetings. Um, uh, something that happened today that uh, was kind of neat was um, we got a flyer from um, uh, Karina, I'm blanking on her last name, but uh, Susan's um, 
liaison to the Latinx community and a flyer about um, about uh, vaccinations and so and and um, also uh, financial help for people who've been impacted by COVID. So uh, contacted Vicky and so she, uh, she's taking some flyers over to the Madrone apartments and we thought that would be a good way to, to do an initial outreach to the Latinx community. Um, uh, Melissa's working on the Kenwood Press, so that's uh, you know that's a, a big part of our outreach. And, um, and I think we've mentioned this before, but we certainly invite other committees to um, you know uh, we can we'll, we're willing to work with other committees within Brown Act limitations to assist with outreach. And uh, Councilmember Handron, anything else to add to that? Um, no, just that I have spoken with a management of both the the large uh, well the large apartment complex on Madrone and then the the smaller one on Madrone as well. Um, and both of them, both management teams are really um, willing to help support us to disseminate information to their tenants. And the um, the Grove on Madrone, the bigger complex. Mm -hmm has a, a electronic system when they can um, push out flyers and information um, pretty easily. So that's a great, great way to get messages out to a big group of people. Great, excellent. Thanks for all your efforts. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's see. I think I hit my three minutes there. Um, and the next is preparedness ad hoc. Uh, safety and I forget the, what the longer name, not safety, um, community preparedness, emergency preparedness. Thanks, thanks, Arthur. Um, yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll give a brief overview and, and, and Matt or Damon, if you wanna chime in, please do. Um, the latest progress, we, you know, after a big burst there at the beginning uh, last month, um, kind of settled in uh, and haven't had any other uh, meetings with other groups uh, more recently, but we did meet amongst ourselves. And um, I, well, I worked on put together a work plan uh, draft that I'll be submitting to the uh, MAC for a present presentation at the next MAC meeting. Uh, but I want to get a little bit more input from within our own team before finalizing that. And um, then we, when we met uh, just uh, recently, we decided to pursue a neighborhood um, outreach and to have a kind of a, kind of a uh, two-tiered approach. One is to um, have Damon take the lead on reaching out to his community as kind of an experiment to, to see how it goes and see, you know, um, uh, how open and willing a specific neighborhood is to adopting this map your neighborhood type approach. And then to also look at how we can disseminate a larger request to the community for leadership, for neighborhood leaders to step, step forward. Um, we decided, well, we need to consult with our outreach committee to find out what's gonna be the best way to go about doing that. Um, so we'll need to communicate about that at some point. And I, I think uh, when it comes time to uh, developing our, our agenda for next month, um, we will want that on the agenda because we would like to um, really get some solid feedback on what's the most practical way to do outreach to the community for neighborhood formation and specifically finding uh, leaders within identified neighborhood groups because um, that's about the only way to make it fly from what what we've learned so far. Um, anything you guys want to add? All right, thank you council member Newhouser. Uh, and then the last ad hoc is uh, traffic and safety. Yeah, thank you. We, we don't have much to report this this month. We are really still trying to gather information about sort of uh, recent history uh, through the now uh, dormant Glen Ellen Traffic and Safety Committee and just obviously trying to understand. There's a lot to understand at the county level. We just heard some of that tonight with Johannes and Janice's presentation, really trying to understand more so we can figure out where we might have some impact. So no big report there. 
Um, the only thing, and Angela, you may have something to add, but before I, I, I lose the floor, I just wanted to mention any, any uh, in terms of the, the, the planning process for the cannabis dispensary at, at Madrone and Arnold, uh, just so the, the comments are due by the end of this month with a, a tentative hearing date scheduled for April 8th. So maybe I can figure out how to get that file on the Facebook page if anyone wants to make comments, but I just wanted to give you some dates around those, around that, that dispensary. Angela, anything else that I should well, cover? Um, yeah. We are gonna meet with a couple of people in the community. One is Nick Brown and we're trying yeah. to schedule that. And um, I didn't let, I didn't tell you this, Kate, but I reached out to Gary Johnson, the, the fire chief who works a lot on traffic and safety issues and he might be meeting with us. So we're, as Kate Great. said, we're trying to gather information and, and you know, create our, our committee here moving forward. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks to both of you for, for all your efforts. Yeah, um, Council Member Handron. Kate, if you, and I can ask you later, but if you have a, a flyer about that cannabis meeting, I can forward it to the um, managers of the apartments on Madrone as well. Great, I have a permit um, email, which is not super clear. So I'll, I'll, okay. I'll figure something out. Yes, thank you though. <laughs> all right, thanks. Um, okay, and any uh, public comments on what we've been discussing in our updates? Uh, it does look like uh, Jay Gamble um, is raising his hand, so I'm going right. to allow him to talk. All right, welcome, Jay. Hi there. I, I'm sorry if there's a, an echo. I can't fix it. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you good. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Um, there will be a story on the, um, uh, the new uh, dispensary hearing coming up in the Kimber Press. It should be out by the 15th, if that helps. If you get any information you need or call me, I've got a bunch of documents that I've been digging up to write the story. So if I can help with that in any way, let me know. Just email me. Uh, that'd be good. Um, a, a passing thought. Um, I guess for Matthew um, on the, somebody was talking about utilities and getting the um, underground and particularly the uh, cable coming down highway 12 and the lack of it uh, there is fiber optics coming down highway 12 that exists uh, if uh, sonic wanted it they would have to lease it from comcast they're required to uh, go to enter those leases uh, they're not required to give it away um, but uh, that's how that would the, the structure of the fiber and the high-speed optics and i've question Dane several times about that and he's particularly not interested in, in making the effort for the few customers that it would take to, and the expense it would take to provide truly high speed internet here especially since Comcast is offering 660 I guess megabytes a second right now at a fairly reasonable rate not reasonable but that's I, was a comment I wanted to make when that discussion came up but again uh, Vicky glad to help with, with that uh, that was kind of a sneak attack when that showed up on February 26th. Anyway, that's all I got to say. Nice meeting, guys. Thanks, Jay. Good to see you. All right. Well, I believe any other public comments? I'm not seeing anyone raise their hand. Okay. So uh, consideration of items for a future agenda. Um, bylaw update coming in April, name change, and some other cleanup. Um, and then um, let's see. I did take down um, uh, Mark's in the minutes since I'm double duty tonight. I yeah. did take down Council Member Newhouser's. Um, I, I summarized it, um, Council Member Newhouser, as prepared not to preparedness ad hoc work plan and outreach study session. Um, that's how I just took notes on that. But I just did want to let you know that that is on. That is on the minutes officially, um, and and we will consider that for April. Yeah, I, I made a note about that too, so we'll we'll get that on the agenda. Um, and then there was a I'm not sure if I totally understand this. Uh, the the note that I have here uh, says alert and warning presentation potential. Ariel can talk about Supervisor Gordon suggested. Try to gauge if there is some interest. I guess this is um, emergency uh, alerts and warnings. Is that right? Yeah, so I can I can mention it and then Supervisor Gordon can flesh it out a bit. Um, but essentially, we have an alert and warning. Um, it's a subset of 
emergency management. Um, and I know early in our in our tenure as a MAC, we did have Nancy Brown um, from from the Department of Emergency Management came to talk about evacuations and, and preparedness. Um, topics, so I guess emergency management, and that would be Chris Godley and uh, some other folks. So it wouldn't be Nancy, but they're bringing, um, I'm not sure if it's just a factual update or um, what it is, but they're bringing that program before the Board of Supervisors and Supervisor Gordon was briefed on it and she thought it might be a great thing for the match to hear. There really isn't, a, you know, you don't have to do it in April. I think it would be after it was heard at the board anyway. So if we want to bump it to May, that's your prerogative. But I think it's something that she thought that you would be, um, that you would all be very interested in. Uh, Supervisor Bourne, do you want to add anything to that? No, you did a great job, Ariel. Um, I know that community preparedness is a priority of yours, as it should be, living in Glen Ellen and Kenwood. And this is an opportunity uh, for the community preparedness team, uh, Office of Emergency Services, uh, to come forward to the board to talk about where we're going with alert and warning systems. And I know they're later on in the year, they will be coming forward with an item talking about evacuation routes. And so, and the sheriff also is is involved in talking about the Nix alerts. So it's up to you if you want an update. Uh, they are ready uh, and prepared to provide an update uh, at at a at a time of your choosing. Um, so I guess the I mean that sounds. Uh, how about just take a straw vote? Who would who would definitely like to hear that update at some point? Just raise your hand or say I yeah. So, okay, so everybody's interested. So the big question is, do we wanna have it next month or do we wanna wait a little bit? Um, I mean, my, my thinking on it is maybe, maybe wait a little bit until we're getting a little bit closer to fire season and people's, will really have people's attention. Um, Although one, one thing I will caution you, um, and I mean, May is not fire season, right? But all of these emergency management folks, if it's fire season, they are not available to do community presentations. No, I would. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't think of going past probably July or August at the very latest. I wouldn't. I wouldn't push it past July. I think. Yeah. Um, I bet if we did it in June. I mean, sounds good. I think we want to do it well before. We don't want to be scrambling around and have them cancel on us. Yeah. All right. Well, straw vote to have that in in June. Put that on the agenda for June. Raise your hand or. Okay, so we'll, we'll work on that. Put that one on the June June agenda. We'll check in again in May, but that's um, that sounds good. All right, any other um, any other topics for the agenda next month? Yeah, Councilmember Nardo Morgan. This is not a topic for the agenda, but it's a question I have. Um, is there any way we can know how many participants were here this evening? And are, are, do we have access to that to see who they are? I think you do. So right, we I think we had six or seven at the height. Right now we have two. Um, people do tend to drift off on meetings. Um, if you, or maybe you have to be a co-host. So really? if, I can see them. You can see them? Mm -hmm. Okay, so on your side panel, um, you should see something that's called participants, or there should be somewhere you can click on participants. Um, and you can, you can, uh, uh, toggle between panelists, which is all you guys and the attendees. And Jay Gamble is raising his hand. Thank you. Yeah, got it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, Jay. Uh, first, first, are there any other additions to the agenda or can we go to public comment? Yeah, oh, I'll just say that I saw 16 on the number of participants at one point. So that I think you're right, we're probably about seven people attending, which I think that might be a record for us. So that's good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I can't see that at all on my on my screen here. I saw no participants at the side, and I don't see any way to participate whatsoever besides raising and lower my hand. Yeah, so, that's, that's because you're an attendee, Jay. Unfortunately, that's that's how we got to do it for the Brown Active meetings. So um, I was addressing the the panelists. So there's panelists and attendees. Okay. Well, I'll ask you that question later. <laughs> I want to get a account of how many people showed up. This is the biggest attendance I can tell so far, which is a, a quadrupling of past performances. Thank you. When I've been the sole participant out there. <laughs> so glad to hear it. 
Right there. You're, you're magnetic, Jay. You're bringing people in. All right. Well, um, any other items for the agenda next month? Yeah, Council Member Das. Again, just a comment, not, not an agenda item. <clears throat> I'd really like to encourage everyone to consider looking at the uh, psychology behind disaster preparedness that Ariel sent out. It's very good. Nancy Brown did an excellent presentation. And if you want to know the difference between or the combination of the theory of optimism bias, the theory of cognitive dissonance, and the theory of planned behavior, that's the video for you. <laughs> it's very good, very well done. And uh, I didn't even know the county had such a person on staff. She's very good. I enjoyed listening to her. Thanks, Damon. Yeah, I, I haven't booted it up yet, but it's on, on my list. It sounds good. All right, well, I think any last chance for comments or agenda items? Well, we did pretty good. Two hours and 10 minutes. That's not bad. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to call the LT uh, do I have movement to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. And uh, I have a second. moved and seconded. So the meeting is now adjourned at 7.40 p.m. And thanks, everybody, for coming. And good to see you all. And um, see you next month. And thank, thank you, everybody. Be safe. Yeah. Thanks, all. Bye. Bye. Stay healthy.